walking in and they were rewarded with quite a remarkable display. They perceived it as a time for their king to be crowned. But where was his kingdom? The king needs a kingdom. According to Mark, Jesus goes straight to the temple on arriving. As soon as he arrives, he goes straight to the temple, which was the spiritual heart of the city. And in verse 11 of Mark 11, it has this interesting point that I just want to make out. So it says in verse 11 of Mark 11, Jesus was looking around at everything. So very easy to miss. I've missed it many times before. So what does that actually mean? Well, a little bit of digging in, uh, and, and there's a, a Greek word called periblapsamenos, which is one of not missing anything. So he looked around at everything. He didn't miss anything. He saw the whole picture. He noticed everything. So Jesus was then well informed that evening to think about what he would do the following day when he returned to the temple. In Job 34, we learn that God's eyes are on the ways of a man or a woman, and he sees all his steps. And this isn't about some sort of sinister government surveillance operation. Uh, it's seeing to the point of care. God knowing all our steps is able to help guide us like a father's care for his child. So Jesus could read the hearts and minds of the people that he interacted with and certainly those that he saw in the temple when he arrived. His eyes saw, but his mind was able to accurately perceive. A story about seeing. So I was chairing a meeting from this very platform earlier this year. Everything was in order, it was all good. You know, for those that are chairmen, they want to make sure everything's right. Due to COVID restrictions, I was sitting in a slightly different position uh, seated instead of stand, uh, standing. And because of where I was sitting, which was different to normal, I couldn't see the pianist. So I was looking for that cue. I looked at the clock that's straight ahead in bright green and it looked to me like it said 10.59. So I thought, OK, well, I'll get up and let's start things going. At the end of the meeting, the person doing the AV came and said to me just quietly, you know you started like five minutes early and I was really taken aback. I thought, no, that's not right. I looked at the clock, it was, it was all good. So what had most probably happened, from what I could tell, is that I've looked over, the pianist has stopped playing briefly, looked over, it's probably been 10.56, but I've thought, well, the music stopped, no one's coming through the door, the doors are closed, it's time to start. So what happened? Well, I think I was so convinced of the musical cue that the only plausible explanation is that I misinterpreted the six for a nine. So my brain interpreted the vision in a different way because of the other senses that I had going on and it all happened in a split moment. Turns out the pianist was simply taking a moment to find a song from another book because we have multiple books, of course. So, and by the way, a shout out to all the musicians. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. That's probably Siri trying to be very um, helpful. Uh, so shout out to all the musicians who do a great job. So my message is that God and Jesus see us. They don't get mixed up by their senses. They don't make mistakes. They know everything. They know our heart. And God invested in us before we were even born. They see us with our human flaws and Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. So back to Mark 11. The next day, Jesus is walking along with his disciples and he sees a tree and it tells us in verse 13 of Mark 11, where we are, in verse 13, seeing a tree from far off having leaves, he went closer to inspect, if perhaps he would find something on it. Seeing afar off the tree. So in reading this, Abby and I thought, uh, maybe this is a bit like the father of the prodigal son. Um, seeing him afar off, he ran to greet him. Uh, but that was a total digression. Uh, Jesus sees the fig tree when he wanted the fruit, 
but he doesn't have any. The tree doesn't have any on the, on the tree, so no fruit. The text makes a point of telling us that it wasn't the season for figs. But then you run into the conundrum of why did Jesus curse the tree? It doesn't seem like the caring and merciful Jesus we've come to know. So why did Jesus do that? Well, a little bit of research. So at this point in late spring, most fig trees haven't developed for mature fruit. However, this particular tree had leaves on it. So from afar off, it looked like it might be an early bloomer. It built up expectation with no fulfillment. If this particular tree had leaves, research shows that it's meant to also have fruit. So it wasn't simply that it wasn't the season. The problem here is that it had leaves which should have indicated fruit, but there was no fruit. There's an echo here to Micah 7 when talking about Israel's woes. No first ripe fig that my soul desires, and every man hunts his brother with a net. A bit like those in the temple ripping off their brothers. And the point here is that one tree professed to be something it wasn't. As far as I can tell, this is the only destructive miracle recorded in the Gospels, which suggests it's an important point being made. So let me just for one moment give you a new picture of how bad things were in the temple. So a historical writer tells us very briefly, the temple area was filled with profiteers who worked in cooperation with the priests and robbed the pilgrims by forcing them to make purchases approved. Approved sacrificial animals and currencies at inflated prices. Every Jewish male had to pay a yearly temple tax. An amount equaling about two days' pay had to be paid in the currency of the temple. And the money exchanges made the exchange into temple money at outrageous rates. A den of thieves inside the spiritual heart. So that just gives you a very quick picture of how bad things actually were there. So how did things get to that point? A bit of reflection. How on earth could someone be okay with what was happening there? Enter what is called cognitive dissonance. The internal battle in our minds of justifying something. It's tiring. There's no rest in it. According to cognitive dissonance theory, when two or more cognitive elements such as behaviours and attitudes, are inconsistent, psychological tension develops, which individuals seek to resolve. Take a smoker who happens to be a doctor, many of them in Europe. They know the risks and outcomes, but life is hard and everyone's going to die from something, so can't they at least have one guilty pleasure? The smoking has been rationalised because of the belief that life isn't perfect and everyone needs something to enjoy in life. So those in the temple ripping people off in God's house would have had psychological tension in trying to put together two inconsistent behaviours. To avoid ongoing dissonance or stress in their minds, they work to rationalise their behaviour. Probably would have been something along the lines of them seeing that their work is helping people come closer to God. So our mind is powerful and it works to resolve internal conflict. The lesson that Jesus taught his disciples in the reading that we had wasn't only one about the fig tree representing Israel or Israel's destruction, although there are certainly echoes to that point. Jesus makes the point of faith. That's where he goes if you just read the, read the chapter. Have faith in God, he told his disciples when they pointed out the withered tree that he had cursed. He says, you too could move a mountain if you told it to move in faith. And it turns out the phrase about removing one's mountain was quite common in the day. It was a Jewish phrase for resolving or removing your difficulties. So it was an example of Jesus relating to people with things they already knew, which is an effective teaching strategy. In verse 23 of Mark 11, in verse 23, it says... Jesus says, Truly I tell you, whoever can say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it is not being questioned in his heart, stipulation, but he is believing that what he is saying is happening, it will happen for him. Jesus also says, if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. 
So imagine the cognitive dissonance, that internal conflict in one's mind of praying to God for forgiveness but not willing to forgive others. That causes dissonance in the mind, certainly linked to our conscience. So what's happening here? I believe in wisdom, God through Jesus is telling us that our faith is linked to single-mindedness, our conviction, and our single-mindedness is linked to us being at peace with our own hearts. Being at peace with our own hearts comes from acknowledging that we are all God's children and we all make mistakes. Very quick fun fact time. What's the tallest mountain on earth from base to peak? I thought I knew the answer. From base to peak, well you'd think it was Mount Everest. So Mount Everest is the highest mountain on earth at 8,848 metres. But it turns out in Hawaii, of course it's Hawaii, Moana Kea is 10,210 metres. It's actually only 4,205 metres above the sea level. That was a surprising point, just because we're talking about moving mountains. So Jesus talking about moving mountains is an abstract concept that helps us understand things in life from a wider perspective. The mountain can represent anything in our life that gets between where we are now and where we need to be. And the sea has the idea of dissolving or swallowing up the mountain so it's no longer a blockade or problem in our lives. Isn't it encouraging to know as well, as a small aside from Luke 17, that even a small amount of faith like a mustard seed goes a long way. So Jesus enters the house of prayer and finds it a den of robbers. There's, a lots, of, there's lots of action, there's lots of bustle, but little righteousness by those ripping people off. Just to state the obvious here and make the connection, there's leaves but there's no fruit. Pulling these threads together then, we have threads of cursing the tree, the echo to the disappointment of the temple, faith, moving mountains without doubt and forgiving others. There's all these threads happening. One way you can link this all is being single-minded in your thoughts and therefore action. Being the same on the outside as on the inside. If you've got the leaves, then you've got the figs. It is being at peace with yourselves and others, helping you to have a hopeful expectation when praying to God. So as we start to wrap things up and reflect, we've got an entrance that disheartened, as Jesus rode in, the people were disheartened because where was the kingdom? A tree which disappointed and a temple which angered. And on the positive flip side, we have faith that moves mountains, a hopeful expectation which receives what it asks for and forgiveness which unburdens people to move forward. So Jesus takes that disappointment, that negativity and righteous anger and he pivots us to the future. That's what I see in Mark 11. To single-mindedness and conviction. Thinking about 2020 so far. Bushfires. Yep, do we remember those? They happened at the beginning of the year. It seems like a long time ago. An ongoing global pandemic. And Christ yet to come with his kingdom. Or come into his kingdom. Like the Jewish people of the time when Jesus rode in but wasn't crowned, we might be disappointed. So what disappoints or has disappointed you this year? And more importantly, where do you take that? What do you do with that? Well, Jesus pointed his disciples to the future to removing what holds them back, to proverbially casting it into the sea and asking in faith with confidence. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 seems applicable for here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, the imagery is powerful. Jesus entered the temple and once he had turned the tables upside down and casted some mountains into the sea, cleared the way, he cleared the way and begins to teach. 
He cleared out the things which were hindering the people, which were blocking their way. So when he taught, he reached them. And so much so that it tells us that the chief priests and the Torah scholars were afraid of him because the entire crowd was being held enwrapped with his teaching. So time for a bit of reflection. What does God see when he sees us? How do we see things? How do we see each other? What story are we telling ourselves about our interactions and perceptions? Our self-critique is sometimes more about external appearances or our status in society as opposed to how God and Jesus see us. Our perceptions of ourselves and others is sometimes from a judgmental lens on ourselves and can be highly critical, comparing ourselves to what and who we see around us. But God and Jesus' lens is different, as we know, isn't it? God wants his glory to be seen in us. It's his will. When he sees us, he doesn't see our faults. He sees us clothed in righteousness through Jesus. And so with that point, similarly, when we see each other, we can see God's glory should we choose to. Not the faults which are common to us all, but God's glory. So to finish, here's what the Bible tells us about how God sees us. So these are meant to be encouraging points about how God sees us. God sees us as a new creation in Christ. God sees us as heirs according to his promise. And we know that God is faithful to all his promises. God sees us as his children. First of John 3 verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children and what we will be has not yet appeared and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. God knowing the past, present and future can see what we will be and he even gives us a helper to assist us get there. His spirit even intercedes for us in prayer. That's pretty amazing. So final quote. So as we come to the Lord's table of remembrance, we remember Jesus through whom grace and truth came. And Ephesians 1 verse 3 to 6. Ephesians 1 verse 3 to 6 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Which one? It says every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And in the original text, that means before the throwdown or before the fall. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So God sees us through Jesus as his children, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved.